All right, it is time to get started. Welcome everyone to this afternoon session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we focus on a new book by Susie Coburn titled Euro Missiles, the Nuclear Weapons That Nearly Destroyed NATO, published in mid-November by Cornell University Press. Our discussants this afternoon are Giordana Polshini and Aaron Bateman. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague and fellow co-chair Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative and nonpartisan venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association. For over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times, in person, at the Wilson Center, and since the pandemic and I guess, post-pandemic era here in the virtual realm. If you have your calendars out, please take note. Next Monday, the Washington History Seminar features Frank Cossel's just published biography, Canon, A Life Between Worlds. And behind, <clears throat> excuse me, behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the American Historical Association. And on the logistics front, please note, that today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. When we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function or the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll call on as many folks as we can. And with those preliminaries out of the way, let's get this seminar fully underway. Christian, all yours. Thanks, Eric. Um, delighted to moderate this panel with three wonderful scholars. I will introduce them in turn. Uh, our key speaker is Susan Colburn. Uh, she is Associate Director of the Program in American Grand Strategy at Duke University. A diplomatic and international historian, she received her PhD in history from the University of Toronto and has held fellowships at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and Yale University's International Security Studies program. She is co-editor of, along with Timothy Sale, of The Nuclear North, Histories of Canada and the Atomic Age, published in 2020, and of course, author of Euromissiles, The Nuclear Weapons That Nearly Destroyed NATO, published last year, the book she will, and we all will be uh, discussing here today. Um, Susie, welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Take it away and take some time. It's a I mentioned this earlier. It's a um, complicated, complex story, um, and uh, uh, so take your time and lay out the story for us. Perfect. Thanks so much, uh, Christian. It's really great to be here. I want to thank the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center for all the great work you do organizing the seminar. I have attended many times, and it's a great honor to be here on the other side of the Zoom. I, so a big thank you to Eric and Christian and then Rachel and Pete for all their work coordinating. And I want to thank Jordana and Aaron for not only making the time to read my book and to be part of this event, but to do so both from Europe, uh, where I am very aware that it is much later than where it is, what it is for me. So I, I'm very grateful. Uh, and, and last but not least, I'm, I'm grateful to everyone tuning in for spending part of your Monday with us. So I'm going to talk this afternoon about my book, Euro Missiles. And the basic idea of the book is to tell a transatlantic history of this group of nuclear weapons known variously as the Euro missiles, theater nuclear forces with an acronym of TNF or intermediate range nuclear forces, an acronym of INF. And these missiles dominated much of the 1970s and 1980s. I want to promise up front that I will keep the acronyms to a minimum I am only doing that in case you know them only by their acronyms and not their full names. So that story is really one that revolves around what might be a kind of unusual cast of characters for a, a history book. And that's three types of medium range missiles. On one side, you had the Soviet Union's RSD-10 Pioneer, a more often known, if known to you at all, by its NATO reporting name, the SS-20 Sabre. And then on the other side of the ledger, there were two U.S. missile systems, the Griffin ground-launched cruise missiles, almost always referred to as GLICMs, uh, a rather unfortunate word version of the acronym GLCM, uh, and then the U.S. Pershing II ballistic missiles. 
And so as the moniker Euro missiles might suggest, these missiles were controversial and known because of their range and the prospect that they could strike Europe from the other side of the continent. So in the the book, the history that I tell is really one that started from a fairly basic puzzle. For many who made policy in Washington and in other capitals across NATO in the 1970s and 1980s, they saw the entire Euro missiles episode as retrospectively a decisive factor in how and why the Cold War ended the way that it did and on the terms that it did. And yet, despite the popularity and prevalence of those arguments, the Euro missiles and the various crises provoked by these missiles uh, have largely faded from broad public memory. And it's an episode that is not well known among those who did not live through it. There's a big generational gap in who remembers the Euro missiles, right? For those who lived through it, it is seared in their consciousness. Uh, front page news, record breaking uh, popular demonstrations against nuclear weapons. And yet, for the students I teach, you mention the Euro missiles and you mostly get confused stares. What's a Euro missile? I've never heard of that before. Uh, and so the book really was designed to set out to answer a simple question. Why did the Euro missiles matter so much? Writing that book was made possible in many respects by time. And here I don't think I'm unique. I am part of a very large cohort of people thinking about the late Cold War from a historical perspective. I see it as a shift made possible by two major phenomena. The first is growing access to archival material from the 1970s and particularly from the 1980s. But the other is a generational shift, that sufficient time has passed that we now have a new generation of scholars thinking about these events who do not have firsthand memories of the Cold War, even of how it ended. And so a group of historians who are interested in revisiting questions that are not personally familiar to them to understand how and why they matter in the broad scheme of how we understand the Cold War or international affairs post-1945. For me personally, that was a critical element of this project. I wanted to write an accessible account, a strong emphasis there on accessible, of an immensely complex issue using recently released and newly available archival material. In other words, what I wanted to do was to write a book that could help explain the stakes of the Euro missiles as an issue to a generation of readers who might not be immediately familiar with the assumptions that underpinned the Cold War, underpinned the nuclear arms race between the superpowers, and justified their respective alliances on either side of the Iron Curtain. And so to do so, I adopted a holistic approach, trying to put various aspects of the Euro missiles as an issue in dialogue with one another. To make that a little bit more concrete, I wanted to put widespread social movements and record-breaking protests alongside alliance politics and nuclear strategy and superpower diplomacy to tell the story of the Euro missiles in the round. And so I made the choice to put NATO at the center. I wanna be clear, I think there is a great book to be written about the Warsaw Pact, and the Euro missiles, but an alliance of 16 by 1982 was already enough of a challenge to fit in a book. And so I hope someone else will take up that challenge who has the language skills in Polish and Czech and German to leverage those sources. But in the book, by putting NATO at the center, I consider the interaction between alliance politics, electoral politics, and superpower politics. Unsurprisingly, that was a choice that shaped how I approached research. And so the book draws on archival work from across the Atlantic Alliance in member states, large and small, the holdings of the NATO archives, as well as records from peace groups and anti-nuclear campaigns, photographs, popular culture, and published media. I used all of these to tell a history of the Euro missiles as a transatlantic issue. And for me, that was critical. Uh, a critical part of doing that was to tell a history of NATO that was not, at the end of the day, just a history of U.S. foreign policy, right? But rather to treat NATO as the complicated and unruly and sometimes frustrating institution that it so often is. So with that as, as backdrop, I want to 
hone in on two pieces of the the story. But for those of you who aren't familiar with the Euro missiles as an episode, it might help if I give you a sort of sketch of the conventional wisdom. Often the way the story of the Euro missiles is told is one that follows a fairly neat arc. The Soviet Union deploys a new set of missiles in the mid-1970s, the SS-20s that I just mentioned. And then in the conventional telling, the NATO allies respond. They debate how they are going to respond to these new Soviet missiles, but convinced that these Soviet missiles pose a distinct threat, a new threat to Western Europe, they cobble together a policy response known as the dual track decision. That decision made in December 1979 includes two tracks, one to deploy new U.S. ground-based missiles to Western Europe, the first uh, of of their type or or general class uh, since 1963, and those are the Pershing twos and Glickums that I mentioned at the top, right? So there's my three missiles in the cast of characters. The second track of that decision, the dual track decision, was that the United States would pursue arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union on those same systems, trying to secure some reductions in the new Soviet missiles. Almost immediately, the dual track decision became incredibly unpopular, a a lightning rod for public dissatisfaction. And the early 1980s were marked by widespread debate and record-breaking protests as citizens across NATO poured into the streets to object to their government's plans or their government's support, uh, depending on where you sat in the alliance, for these new missiles. Because of the way the dual track decision had worked, there was a long time lag between uh, when the decision was taken in 1979 and when the deployments would begin scheduled for late 1983. And so those four years were uh, immensely uh, heightened tensions, right? A very tense period in alliance politics, but a very tense period in international politics. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little later, but if we think about the sort of cultural zeitgeist of the 1980s, there were a lot of mushroom clouds uh, everywhere, a lot of concerns about what would happen, whether the Cold War would turn hot. And then that story, if that is the height of the crisis, our arc fairly precipitously falls off in the conventional telling that within four short years, you go from the NATO allies seeing through the first deployments in the fall of 1983 and the Soviet Union responding by walking out of the arms control talks in Geneva to Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev signing the INF Treaty in Washington, D.C., getting rid of the entire class of nuclear weapons, all of these missiles that were now known as intermediate range nuclear forces. And so it seems at first glance in that arc to be the perfect policy outcome, a a win at every stage. And the story that I tell in the book doesn't debunk that, but tries to contextualize that neat arc in a more complicated story to explain how its roots were much deeper and the aftermath, a sort of forgotten episode of the Euro missiles that occurred after the signing of the INF Treaty. And and to capture much of the uncertainty, right? So with hindsight, we know that there was that sort of neat arc that it appears. But for those who lived through it, None of those episodes were so certain. And so one of the things that I I tried to capture in the book is just that sense of uncertainty and how many different paths might have been taken. So with that as a a backdrop, and anyone, whether it's Jordana or Aaron or anyone out there in the the audience, should feel free to probe me on any pieces of that story. I'm going to, for with an eye to the time, focus primarily on two aspects here and, and dig into them a little bit more. The first is about the beginning moment, where the issue of the Euro missiles comes from. And then I'll, I'll turn and talk a little bit about that forgotten episode that I alluded to, what happens after the signing of the INF Treaty in 1987. 
So the conventional wisdom, as I just indicated, holds that the entire issue of the Euro missiles really originates with the Soviet deployment of the more advanced SS-20s in the mid-1970s. These weapons were a significant upgrade in Soviet capabilities in the European theater from an earlier generation of medium and intermediate range missiles like the SS-4s and SS-5s. And so in the conventional telling, the Soviet SS-20s posed a new threat to Western Europe and forced NATO to respond with deployments of its own. NATO's response, as this, this telling so often goes, was spurred by a famous speech given by the West German Chancellor of the day, uh, the Social Democrat Helmut Schmidt, at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London in October of 1977. And Schmidt's warning uh, served as the sort of clarion call culminating at, you know, moving the ball forward, sounding the alarm about the risk to NATO and setting off a chain of events leading to NATO's 1979 dual track decision. That conventional wisdom misses the point. The arrival of the Soviet SS-20s did not create a new problem. It added to an already existing one. The Western allies, particularly the Federal Republic of Germany or West Germany, were already deeply concerned about the implications of what they of parity between the United States and the Soviet Union. So the prospect that both of the superpowers had reached a degree of size and shape in their strategic nuclear arsenals that they could offset one another were relatively equal. Those concerns were made worse with the signing of the first agreement to limit strategic weapons the 1972 uh, U.S.-Soviet Agreement, SALT I, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. West Germans, in particular, worried that parity would erode the United States' ability to extend its deterrent to Europe. But even after the deployment of the SS-20s, the degree to which these new weapons uh, posed, these new Soviet weapons, posed a risk to NATO was far from clear. West German officials were alarmed and worried about the rise of a distinct correlation of forces in Europe, separate from that of between the United States and the Soviet Union. So something that they often referred to as the Euro strategic balance. But basically, the idea was that the situation in Europe, the, the security situation, the strategic situation facing Western Europeans was different than that of the United States. And this raised the specter of decoupling which was a rather clunky word, but a classic boogeyman of NATO politics, where officials on both sides of the Atlantic worried that the United States' ability to protect Western Europe might no longer be effective. Both the Ford and Carter administrations offered repeated assurances that the new Soviet missiles did nothing to change the overall balance of power, that that the protection offered by the U.S. nuclear umbrella would remain the same even with the upgrades in the Soviet arsenal. The Carter administration's shift in position was the result of another nuclear issue, the crisis over the enhanced radiation warhead, a weapon better known as the neutron bomb. Press leaks in the summer of 1977 drew attention to this new tactical weapon buried in the budget of one of the U.S. agencies. And news of this neutron bomb quickly set off a firestorm and galvanized protesters. It stoked a resurgence of anti-nuclear activism after years in the doldrums. And against that mounting public opposition, the NATO allies struggled to cobble together a plan to deploy these new anti-tank systems. That was a painstaking effort as they tried to reach an agreement it was an effort that occupied much of the winter and spring of 1977 and 1978. And then when the allies were finally on the verge of approving a complicated three-part package, Jimmy Carter pulled the plug. The entire package was scrapped. Carter's decision was roundly criticized. His choice to walk away from the package was taken as evidence of moralistic temporizing and a lack of leadership, confirming many of the worst stereotypes already circulating about what kind of president or foreign policy leader Jimmy Carter was. In the press, aides of Helmut Schmidt and his longtime foreign minister, Hans-Dietrich Genscher, mocked Carter and derided him as a religious dreamer. 
Carter, for his part, refused to let members of his administration push back, much as some of them, uh, Zbig Brzezinski and the Vanguard, wished to do so. But Carter believed the cost would be too high if it caused even more difficulty in the administration's dealings with Helmut Schmidt's Federal Republic. There was, I think this is no, uh, we can't exaggerate this, no love lost between Carter and Schmidt. It was a very acrimonious personal relationship. And Carter aides described Schmidt as a know-it-all, convinced he would be a better president if only he were eligible for the post. Now, I provide this capsule of the neutron bomb episode and that political fallout to show that the road to the dual track decision was not a direct line from the SS-20, but rather had a number of other intervening stops along the way. What convinced the Carter administration that it was critical to respond particularly to West German concerns was the fallout from the neutron bomb episode. That political fallout made it impossible to continue ignoring or shunting aside West German concerns about the new Soviet SS-20s and the overall viability of NATO's strategy of flexible response, this escalatory strategy uh, that NATO had adopted at the time where it could uh, plan to meet Soviet capabilities at every step of the chain in a rough sense in order to ensure that deterrence held. It was only in the wake of the neutron bomb that the Carter administration came around on the need to deploy new missiles to Western Europe. It took another 18 months to reach an agreement. And what resulted in December 1979, the dual track decision I discussed briefly a few moments ago, was a complicated arrangement around those two main components. The first track included a complicated sharing of the burden. So it did not just call for the deployment of the Griffins of Pershing IIs, but rather a complex system in which those weapons would be deployed in a number of Western European allies, as the West Germans were insistent that they could not shoulder the burden of those deployments alone. And so to avoid singularization of the West Germans, as the jargon went, the decision, uh, the end decision called for deployments in the United Kingdom, Italy, Belgium, and the Netherlands, though it was always a little unclear whether each and every one of those countries and their parliaments would go along with the, the deployments in 1983. The second track was to undertake arms control negotiations in parallel on those same systems in order to bring down the Soviet arsenal. The decision was a classic product of alliance wrangling. It expressed a degree of consensus, but virtually no one agreed on the underlying logic or relationship between the deployment track and the arms control track. If broadly the story I have told you up to now is about the dual track decision as a form of reassurance for the United States to reassure its allies in Western Europe, that deterrence was still credible, that extended deterrence would hold, that flexible response was viable as a strategy, it produced virtually the opposite result. It created an immense amount of anxiety among those countries, voters and citizens. The dual track decision came at a point in time where a string of problems were already plaguing US-Soviet relations. And within two weeks of NATO's decision, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Superpower relations seemed in a free fall. And a growing number of citizens across the Western Alliance in Europe and in North America worried that the Cold War had returned with a vengeance. Mounting fears of, a nucle of a nuclear annihilation came to define the first years of the 1980s, something that is so visible in even a brief survey of the popular culture of the day. You think of war games or threads or 99 red balloons, even in one of the early James Bond movies of the 1980s, the premise is foiling a nuclear attack by a Soviet general, rogue Soviet general. With mushrooms cloud, mushroom clouds everywhere in the sort of uh, the climate and uh, uh, of the time, it was far from certain whether NATO could in that climate see the deployments through. Widespread popular opposition to nuclear weapons provided ample openings for the Soviet Union and its allies in the Warsaw Pact to try and stop the deployments NATO envisioned. 
Soviet Union and its allies across uh, the Warsaw Pact amplified homegrown dissent. They provided funds and carefully calibrated messaging to maximize discontent. But I want to be crystal clear. Critics came, critics of the dual track decision came from diverse backgrounds and political traditions. They were not by any means all bankrolled by the Soviets or in cahoots with the communists. They posed the missiles on a variety of grounds, from fr a frankly understandable fear of nuclear war to a rejection of the underlying logic of the bipolar structures of the Cold War. Some had religious objections to the morality of nuclear deterrence. Others made an economic case that the funds poured into the nuclear arms race could be better applied to other big ticket items like healthcare or education. The concerns about the prospect that the Cold War might turn hot were amplified by the arrival of a new president. Ronald Reagan was seen by many, for better or for worse, as an anti-Soviet hawk willing to talk tough and spend reams of money to defeat the Soviet Union. And that early rhetoric only stoked concerns that the Cold War might boil over into a nuclear conflagration. It's not hard to imagine that press people uh, in Reagan's team going out and commenting that a nuclear war was survivable if only there were enough shovels might leave some anxious about the world in which they lived. All of that public debate and opposition, which I'm happy to talk more about in the Q&A, created immense pressure on allied governments to rethink whether or not they would support the deployments scheduled for 1983. But ultimately, after immense public diplomacy efforts uh, and considerable coalition politicking and, and uh, work within the alliance, the deployments were able to move ahead in 1983, weathering a major test. Votes in the British, Italian, and West German parliaments all approved the arrival of new missiles. And when the West Germans voted to accept their slate of missiles in 1983, the Soviet Union responded by walking out of arms control talks. As I alluded at the top of my remarks, there was a rapid transformation that followed. In four years, uh, the issue went from the Soviets walking out of arms control talks to Reagan and Gorbachev signing the INF Treaty. And I cannot overstate the degree to which that was a product of Mikhail Gorbachev, of his thinking and his diplomacy. It was Gorbachev who was willing to rethink critical aspects of the Soviet arms control position, willing to untie the package and decouple uh, an agreement on intermediate range nuclear forces from the Strategic Defense Initiative. Gorbachev was willing to accept a lopsided deal that retained clear U.S. advantages. The Soviets destroyed 1,000 more missiles in the final agreement signed in December 1987 and agreed to a much more aggressive inspection regime than they'd ever agreed to before. But the treaty also preserved U.S. technological advantages, as if those earlier advantages were not enough. The United States and the Soviet Union dismantled and destroyed every ground-based missile from 500 to 5,500 kilometers, but that left air and sea launch missiles, where the United States had decisive advantages, untouched. If we think about how the United States waged wars in the 1990s, it's hard not to uh, escape that that was a huge and formative decision for the United States and the way it operated in the world, used military power in the world after the Cold War. I want to fast forward to the end. I know I've gone quickly through the 80s because I think it's the best known part of the story. And I have a feeling Jordana and Aaron will pepper me with some questions that will enable me to go deeper into that part. I want to flag this forgotten episode at the end. It's easy to see the INF story ending at that table in Washington, D.C. with Reagan and Gorbachev seated side by side. But the aftermath of the INF Treaty caused a whole new round of angst within NATO as an alliance. The alliance confronted familiar difficulties about how credible extended deterrence, that protection the United States afforded with nuclear and conventional weapons over Western Europe, would be now as a result of the removal of the ground launch cruise missiles and Pershing II's. There was also a new round of problems over the weapons left outside of the INF Treaty, those short-range nuclear forces, or SNF, with a range under 500 kilometers, for due for modernization in a sort of terrible and unfortunate coincidence of timing. 
Those weapons caused particular problems in the Federal Republic of Germany as their short range drew attention to nearly all of the uncomfortable aspects of the West German position as a state in a divided nation straddling the front lines of the Cold War. If we visualize a map of Cold War Europe, the prime place you would want to station a weapon with a range under 500 kilometers is close to the border. And that meant in West Germany, targeting West Germany's neighbors. It was a particularly fraught prospect in 1989 when it seemed a, a terrible way to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Nazi invasion of Poland by upgrading the weapons targeting Poland from German soil. West German frustration and bitter debate over whether or not to modernize these missiles created knock-on problems in the alliance. Margaret Thatcher in particular chafed at West German opposition, frustrated at what she saw as an increasingly outsized West German role in NATO's decision-making. She worried that a swell of popular opposition and deaf diplomacy on the part of Mikhail Gorbachev would leave the Western allies exposed and facing pressure to remove SNF, remove all of the short-range nuclear forces just as they had done with the intermediate-range ones. The end result, Thatcher worried, would be the complete denuclearization of Europe, an unraveling of NATO's deterrent, and with it the foundations of peace in post-war Europe. And so even in 1989, there was deep concern about the durability and viability of NATO's policies. The earlier deliberations and debates of the 1980s had fractured the security consensus in a number of NATO allies. And with that fracturing, many wondered if the alliance could still maintain and justify a posture based, at the end of the day, on nuclear weapons. It was a question that was ultimately swept away with the Berlin Wall and the communist regimes of Eastern Europe. But that sense of fragility, whether the still fresh debates over SNF modernization or the scars of the difficulties from the early 1980s remained. And I think against that backdrop, it is not difficult to see why so many allied officials were eager to see NATO play a vital role in the emerging post-Cold War order rather than pack up shop and start over again. By way of conclusion, I want to flag one key takeaway, and in many respects, it is just a classic historian's reminder. It is all too tempting, knowing what we know about how this episode turned out, to look back and see a perfect arc, and to assume it was a well-planned and wonderful success. That, that neat arc, that convenient story, gives people confidence that we can somehow repeat the same success over again. And the story I tell in the book with all its meandering and contradictions and complexities, I hope might give a few of those people pause. The Cold War was not guaranteed to end the way that it did, without nuclear conflict in Europe or with NATO fully intact. And as those events recede into the past, we would do well to remember how easily it might have turned out another way than the way it did. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Susie. Um, great uh, um, survey um, of the uh, book and your argument. Um, now on to our commentators. Our first commentator is Dr. Giordana Pulcini. She's a lecturer in international history at Roma Tre University, global fellow with the Wilson Center's Nuclear Proliferation International History Project, and really one of the key uh, drivers and organizers behind um, our uh, nuclear history um, boot camp. She teaches an MA course on the history of transatlantic relations at the University of Romatre. Her topics of research are nuclear history, U.S. nuclear strategic policy in the 70s and 80s, and U.S. nonproliferation policy during the Cold War. Uh, Jordana was recently involved in a project supported by the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority on the end of the INF Treaty. In the last uh, few years, she has conducted extensive research, archival research in the United States, Italy, and India. Jordana, it's wonderful to welcome you to the Washington History Seminar. The Zoom room is all yours. Thank you, Christian, and thank you for having me. And 
thank you, Susie, for uh, uh, your presentation and congratulations again for your uh, for your book. And I want to start by saying that uh, you definitely uh, achieved your goal of making a very complex uh, story um, that you um, that you reconstructed in this book. Uh, easy to read and easy to understand. I mean, uh, if it was not about uh, such uh, uh, also dangerous story, I would say it was uh, entertaining sometimes. I mean, uh, th there were some parts and I want to mention uh, a couple of them, uh, some pages that I particularly appreciated. Uh, uh, for example, when you uh, talked about the Guadalupe Summit, uh, uh, I could almost uh, picture the four leaders uh, uh, in front of the beach talking about the dual track decision. Uh, or, for example, uh, when you uh, told about uh, the uh, the joke uh, by um, the Soviet negotiator uh, at Geneva, uh, Vitinsky, uh, about the rabbit and the train. Uh, and I could picture again uh, the astonished faces of the US negotiators uh, um, that were listening to such a joke. So um, I think uh, it's not easy because it was a really uh, complex story. And I'm, I uh, really appreciated the fact that uh, it was uh, uh, easy to read, easy to understand, and easy to follow. Not only the account, but also the many arguments you uh, you made throughout the book. Um, and uh, it, it is a complex story. And from this book, you can understand uh, um, really how um, the that was a, a long story that started in the early 60s and ended in the late uh, in the late 80s so you cannot you cannot just go from 1966 and 1976 deployment of the SS20 to 1987 the INF3 it's a much longer story and uh, the book has an impressive breadth um, because really you can follow uh, what happened from the um US and later NATO adoption of the flexible response uh, to the uh, and the uh, um adoption of the armor report uh, to the debate surrounding uh, the uh, SNF uh which I'm I'm glad you talked about them because I think that was one of the best part of the book when you uh when you speak about uh, the uh, aftermath of the um of the um Euro missile uh, story and the aftermath of the INF uh, uh, of the INF treaty. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, another uh, element that I really appreciated uh, uh, of your book is the the fact that you can easily follow the bigger picture. So the uh, superpower negotiations, uh, uh, the exchanges uh, uh, among the uh, allies, uh, the um, historical context, uh, the entire Euro missile saga, without losing the importance of details. There are so many details in your uh, in your book that uh, are always uh, connected with the bigger picture, and I think this is very very important. And um, you were able to uh, follow the uh, unfolding of the negotiations, um, uh, the domestic developments uh, in uh, um, in the key uh, Western European countries, uh, as well as the reconstruction. And this is something uh, I think was uh, really difficult to do: was the reconstruction of the multifaceted anti-nuclear movement. Uh, which, as you uh, as you repeated many times in the book, was not uh, um, was non monolithic. It was a, a kaleidoscopic uh, movement with many different souls, uh, uh, many different uh, people, movements, and groups. And you were also uh, able to tackle um, what I would call uh, the elephant in the room. So the fact that uh, um, these movements uh, uh, were somehow connected uh, to the communist forces uh, 
in the um, in in Europe, so both uh, the uh, the the Soviet uh, role, you know, in trying to maneuvering these uh, uh, these movements, but also the uh, national communist forces uh, that try to uh, play an influence on these uh, on these movements. And you you discuss you now the uh, the role that these communist forces uh, uh, and pressures had on the uh, on the movements, which was. Uh, uh, sometimes a very negative impact because it reproposed some some of the Cold War divides inside the, the movements. No, uh, supporting or not supporting the the Soviet Union, what the Soviet Union was doing, for example, in the eighty um, in the early eighties uh, uh, in Poland. Not uh, all these uh, uh, all these created problems uh, uh, for uh, um, an anti nuclear movement that somehow was tainted by this uh, uh, this communist. Uh, 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 presence. Um, really, another uh, very important theme of the book that I already anticipated that I found extremely interesting is your reflection on the um, implementation of the flexible response. And I think uh, the subtitle of the book could have been The Rise and Fall of Flexible Response in, uh, in NATO, basically. And uh, uh, you reconstruct how the um, alliance struggled with uh, such an elusive concept, no, and the ambiguity of the uh, of the concept, which was uh, uh, a strength but also a great weakness, no, because uh, on on one side the fact that it was uh, an ambiguous concept helped, no, to uh, basically uh, create, no, the uh, credibility of the establish the credibility of flexible response on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, it left the. Uh, uh, so many unanswered questions uh, uh, that uh, uh, repeatedly appeared in the uh, in the allies interaction now from the late 60s uh, to the late 80s that somehow um contributed to almost uh, uh, as you uh, mentioned uh, a few times almost destroy no uh, nato or the consensus uh, uh, inside uh, inside nato um also this ambiguity and this difficulty in dealing with uh, uh, flexible response uh, created also uh, other uh, other ambiguities. For example, uh, um, the um, the role of theater force uh, modernization now from. Uh, uh, the uh, Nixon era, when the, this modernization was discussed uh, um, for for the first time, uh, to the uh, neutral neutral neutron bomb uh, issue, and to the um, INF treaty uh, SNF uh, uh, SNF uh, episode, and. Um, um, it's also connected with uh, uh, one of the most dangerous uh, uh, concepts for the alliance, the Euro strategic concept, no? Uh, that was uh, um, also uh, perceived as uh, uh, a way to update no? the NATO strategic concept on one hand, but on the other hand could be the foundation of uh, uh, another weakness. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll try now to end with my comments and then move into some questions. But another thing that I wanted to say and that I wanted to mention was that um, something that I found very fascinating and I think was another very successful uh, part of the book was when you speak about uh, the merits and the fallacies of the dual track decision. So the dual track decision um went from being or basically saving nato no uh, at the uh, in the late in the late, late 70s uh, to becoming almost a disaster no because of this four years period uh, between the dual track decision and the deployment of the missiles uh, um and the fact that uh, uh, it backfired multiple times as well and it backfired as much as the zero option. So the zero option was the perfect solution in the early, in the early 80s when it was proposed. And there was a lot of enthusiasm uh, by the allies because it was also a way to somehow contain the criticism uh, toward the, uh, the, the deployment of the, of the missiles. But on the other hand, uh, 
the 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 the, the Europeans that had approved the, the zero option uh, uh, thought that it was a very bad idea when it was uh, actually almost implemented. No, in uh, um, in uh, um, it was proposed and then implemented in 1986, 1987. Um, so uh, moving to uh, oh. Another uh, another point that I wanted to mention is the, um, the way you speak about the German paradox, which I think it's really the heart of your uh, of your book, no? Uh, and uh, um, the fact that basically um, most of the uh, concern uh, that led to the deployment of uh, uh, or the uh, idea of the modernization came from. Uh, uh, the uh, security problems of the Federal Republic of Germany. And then this raised the, the Allies' attention on Germany and on uh, uh, Germans uh, um, and of Germans' capabilities and intentions. So it was a sort of a vicious circle in which um, Germany was both the reason to uh, start the discussion, but also uh, a break to the uh, to, to the discussion uh, itself. Uh, and so, my first question is actually about uh, uh, about Germany, about Western Germany. So, how much do you think uh, uh, the um, Germans' acceptance of the NPT? Uh, had a role in uh, in this story, okay? Which is something that you mentioned, but very briefly. But I think uh, was really really important. I mean, I mean the fact that the um, Federal Republic of, Republic of Germany officially renounced the uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and my uh, second question uh, um, is about. Uh, uh, the uh, role of the Nixon era modernization program, uh, the Schlesinger doctrine, uh, and so on and so forth. So, how important was uh, uh, how important was uh, that uh, program on the um, on what actually happened later in the, in the seventies? So. Mm, is it possible that basically the United States were, were selling something that they had already decided to deploy and started to develop? Because, of course, the development of the missiles had started years before, did not start in, in 1979, and the SS-20 just helped to sell that. And connected with this question, since in the early 70s there was Nixon and then there was a Carter, and also there were different leaders in, in Europe. So how much the change of leadership had an influence in this story? And my last question, I had many more, but I've spoken already too much, was uh, I think that one of the great questions that remain unanswered in your book is uh, uh, why did the Soviet Union decide to uh, deploy no, the SS-20? And this is a question that you could not answer because there is already, there is a, uh, a huge debate no, that could not be answered by, by many historians. There are many theories, but we lack the, uh, the, the sources to fully answer this, this question. So uh, what if Bundy, Mector Bundy was, was right when he said that basically the, the SS-20 uh, did not make a difference. What if all this was for nothing? And uh, um, so what about uh, uh, this possibility? And uh, is it possible that it doesn't even matter because the, the whole story was a, at the end of the day, a shock, but also therapeutic for the, for the Alliance? Thank you. Thanks, Jordana. Susie, you wanna take on these, these questions? Yeah, there's a light package of questions. Yeah. We'll give Aaron some time to think of some more. Um, yeah, this is this is great. And I really appreciate all your kind comments about, about the book. Um, I'll focus on the questions, but maybe draw in a couple of the, the strands that you highlight there. Um, I'll maybe take them in chronological order so we can start with the, the Nixon era program of modernization and, and the Schlesinger Doctrine, right? The studies that the Nixon administration did on the potential of limited nuclear options uh, in the 1970s um, and whether or not they were selling a missile already developed. One of the most interesting parts of the story for me as I was writing this 
is how when you start to pull the threads before 1976, how far back they run. So the biggest debate I had in the book was where do you start? I had a previous version where I started in uh, 1952 with the failure with the Lisbon decision about force structures within NATO and and debates about how you reconcile conventional versus nuclear power. And then uh, that was a very long and meandering version. And so that got sort of truncated into the introduction. But the point of, of sharing that is not that, you know, I am like many authors, somebody who burned through many structures before settling on one, uh, though that is true. Uh, but but that so much of the story of the Euro missiles is about the structural problems of NATO, right? If you were to design an alliance in the early Cold War and you could have your pick of what you would have, NATO has the worst geography of what you would ever choose. You would never want your most powerful state to be an ocean away from all of the countries that you'd like to project protect. And then you need to, in particular, protect this divided country on the front lines that all of its neighbors have, for good reason, some concerns about. And so there is a multi-layered structural problem that NATO is sort of constantly navigating during the, the Cold War. The The Nixon era programs in particular, I think, are a really telling admission of exactly this uh, this ambiguity of flexible response that, that you were talking about before, Jordana, right? That it's an admission. The Nixon administration is, is happy to acknowledge privately that flexible response does not work and that they do not have the plans to make it work. Frank Gavin has written about this beautifully. Uh, but I think the piece of the story where I add to Frank is to is to say that even though it did not work and there it was widely accepted already in the early 1970s that it did not work you politically needed to make it look like it could work and so it did there was a military rationale that that never really panned out quite the way that they wanted but the political rationale was so important that you needed to maintain the convenient fiction and so the the that was always the struggle of the the Schlesinger doctrine and those modernization programs was that they were really difficult to sell in an allied context. Uh, and but but ultimately they end up getting many of the programs that are that the United States invests in in the Nixon years are not justified in an alliance context, they're justified in a, a US Soviet arms control context, right? So and in domestic politics. So once SALT won the 1972 agreement on strategic arms. Uh, is faces uh, some backlash at home from people like Scoop Jackson. The administration, the Nixon administration, is looking for ways that they are going to be able to pick up bargaining chips to potentially bring the Soviets to the negotiating table in future rounds. And that's a lot of the early justification for some of these cruise missile programs. Uh, you know, going back to research that had been done in the 1950s uh, and then jump starting it with an eye towards what you might bargain away in in future. The problem is, is that then by the late 1970s, uh, the cruise missile has some appeal to Western Europeans uh, as more than just a bargaining chip, right? But that there's an actual interest in the weapons themselves and how they might be able to shore up flexible response to make flexible response work better. Um, uh, in terms of the West German acceptance of the NPT, I think that, yeah, it. It, I would put the NPT, the West German signature on the NPT as part of a larger package of sort of how the status quo crystallizes in the 1960s. So you have the, the formalization of earlier West German commitments not to produce atomic weapons, uh, but you also have the abandonment of years of schemes about nuclear sharing. So, you know, you've seen the rise and fall at that point of the multilateral force of the NATO stockpiling program debated in the late 1950s. Uh, and so after having pursued a whole bunch of really complicated boondoggles to try and make it so that the allies felt like they had a share in the nuclear arsenal, then that chapter sort of closes and then it opens another door of how you potentially resolve that debate through other means. And this is when it's the deployment of U.S.-owned missiles uh, 
in order to make that that more credible. So I see that NPT as sort of part and parcel of a broader stabilization of the landscape and West Germany's place uh, within it. Um, how much did changes of leadership matter? I mean, th this is a great story in many respects because as much as I have emphasized the structural side, it is hard to escape how much individual people matter. It's a it's a textbook case for our students of how structures can matter, but individual people and their personalities and quirks can also change the, the shape of history. I mean, it is hard to imagine a deal in 1987 without a Reagan or a Gorbachev. I, I think that's so much a function of their own personalities. But I, you think about even you were asking this this more specifically in the context of the 1970s, I think, and I, I think that there is there are a number of places where the individual person really shapes the way the conversation unfolded. Uh, it is critical to the story that Helmut Schmidt had such a lengthy background in strategic issues and had written widely about how NATO's nuclear strategy would work. But just as much, I think it mattered that in Carter, you had a president who uh, was willing to change his mind about his policy. I didn't particularly like Helmut Schmidt, but uh, was when he made policy choices that made transatlantic relations more difficult, he was willing to recalibrate and change tack in order to provide reassurance to the West Germans. Um, and so you have you have some some key inter personal interventions uh, that that I think really shape the way the story unfolds. And and that's true. I could pick any number of other episodes from the story that that that's also true of, but I, I won't with an eye to the time. Mm -hmm. Um, the last question you ask is probably the hardest, right? Uh, so the, the first piece of that, why did the Soviet Union to decide to deploy? I consciously decided to stick with what we know uh, because we don't know. Uh, but one thing that is so striking, uh, even without the Soviet sources uh, that really nail down the decision, uh, we is that there is a logic that was clear even in the late 1970s and early 1980s to Western observers that the parameters of SALT-1 had created a context in which the, the Soviet deployment of the SS-20 actually tracked with many of the broader principles of strategic stability that U.S. and so Soviet negotiators had agreed to. Um, if if, as you hypothesize, quoting McGeorge Bundy, the Soviet missiles did not make a difference, uh, and and then was it all for nothing? Uh, it's a great question. It's a hard question to answer. But I, I think that this is where I would come back to the degree to which, not just in the story I tell in the book, but in NATO's history writ large, perception is reality. And so it doesn't matter if the Soviet missiles didn't actually change the threat. Key U.S. allies believed that they did. And so as a result, the whole set of convenient fictions seemed slightly less plausible. And then that created cascading crises of confidence uh, in the whole system. And so in a system that relied so deeply on confidence, uh, it was critical to meet the that that erosion of confidence, even if it wasn't critical to meet the wh whether or not you agreed that this, the Soviet missiles needed to be countered. That turned out not to actually be the thing that needed to be responded to. Thank you. Um, before um, I give Aaron, who's been patiently waiting now at 11 p.m. at night, I think uh, in Oslo, um, uh, the, the, the floor. Uh, let me remind our viewers that um, uh, if there's time, we will have, uh, we will, uh, we'd like to bring you into the conversation. Uh, we will preference those of you who uh, use the raise hand function and can uh, chime in directly. Uh, you'll be queued and um, asked to mute yourself, or uh, as some of you have already done, uh, you can use the um, Q&A function, and I'll put some of those questions to our panelists. With that, Aaron, uh, let me introduce uh, our final um, commentator, speaker. Um, Aaron Bateman is Assistant Professor of History and International Affairs at George Washington University. He is a faculty member in the Space Policy Institute within the Elliott School of International Affairs.
Uh, his research takes place at the nexus of science, technology, and national security during the Cold War. Uh, Dr. Bateman, Bateman's work draws from archival collections in the United States, Western Europe, and the former Soviet Union. His first book places, places Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative in the context of a more militarized American approach to space that had emerged in the 1970s and shows how divergent views of space militarization influenced U.S. foreign relations through the end of the Cold War. With that, Aaron, over to you uh, for your comments and questions. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me, and I'm going to um, try to keep my, my comments and questions as short as possible to leave uh, room for Q&A as well. Um, so just right off the bat, I, I want to say, Susie, I think the book is such a valuable contribution uh, to political, diplomatic, social, and military histories of the Cold War. I think you did a really fantastic job weaving together the complex interalliance deliberations over defense strategy and arms control and bringing in these social movements that were of such great consequence for NATO's decision making in the 70s and 80s. Um, I think your archival work is living proof of the fact that many of the alliance's key exchanges and discussions uh, took place outside of the formal alliance organizations and channels. Um, and I really want to applaud your hard work in so many different archives on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, that's that's no easy feat. Um, so there's a few uh, aspects of the book's framing um, that I want to highlight as uh, especially significant um, and, and echo some of the comments that were already made. And the first is that the book shows that the 80s were not wholly unique in terms of crisis in the alliance and uh, that tensions in the 80s were really in continuity with earlier concerns about U.S. security guarantees in Europe the role of West Germany in the alliance, and the consequences of strategic arms limitation for the balance in Europe. And uh, to this end, I think you did a really nice job putting NATO's alliance dynamics in the 80s into a much broader context, going all the way back to the 1960s without losing perspective on these critical developments uh, in, in the 1980s. Um, I think you also did a very effective job of decentering the United States from the story without losing sight of the significance of the United States, both in transatlantic and superpower relations. And finally, uh, the book shows just how significant various social movements were in shaping political discussions, especially about arms control, as well as nuclear modernization and nuclear strategy, um, and also showing how there, there wasn't perhaps as much uniformity in these various social movements as was previously thought. Um, I think a, a key theme throughout the book is this, this theme of tension stemming from the desire for stability, but yet needing to have an external threat that can justify the alliance's existence. And this, of course, is not something that's unique to the time period uh, that Susie's looking at here. This is something that, that, that we've seen in the, uh, the post-Cold War era um, as well. And the tension plays out very prominently in the context of detente. Um, and I, I think the book really contributes to a growing body of literature that prompts us to reconsider the nature of detente. Uh, and I think that uh, you compellingly argue that detente was not a departure from the Cold War, but rather a new, more effective means of waging it. Uh, and these observations really underscore the competitive aspects of U.S. arms control strategy in the 1970s. Uh, in the in the divergent views on what strategic stability meant, divergent views from the standpoint of the U.S., Western Europeans, and uh, and the Soviet Union, as well. Um, thinking about the historiography of nuclear weapons, uh, and and also echoing uh, comments that uh, were made a few moments ago about uh, flexible response, uh, we find that there were just so many divergent views of nuclear strategy within NATO. Um, and we can see just how divergent were the public presentations of flexible response from the fact that it was not uh, flexible in reality. And I hope that as more archives are open, we'll get even greater insight into NATO's nuclear planning along with the Alliance's conventional military coordination mechanisms. Uh, something that really struck me uh, was the insight that the book provides into the nature of arms control agreements and thinking about what is actually required uh, to make a successful arms control agreement happen. Uh, and we can see just how messy the arms control deliberation process was among members of NATO and how consensus was oftentimes lacking um, and how the embrace of zero in particular really left so many of the Western Europeans uh, terrified. Um, thinking about this, this idea of the imbalance 
uh, of the INF Treaty, I think it's really interesting to consider why Gorbachev was indeed willing to sign off on so imbalanced a deal. Um, and, and you talk about the severe economic challenges, his own struggles with alliance management, and the fact that both he and several of his advisors were trying to rethink the role of Moscow in the world. Um, and, and, and seeing that pressure from uh, ground launch cruise missiles and Pershing twos were perhaps really secondary considerations uh, at best in Gorbachev's calculus. Um, but I, I think in zooming out, and, and when we think about uh, especially perhaps policymakers today that are trying to look to the 1980s uh, and, and find lessons that can be derived for arms control today, I think that your book actually shows that the situation in the 1980s, the conditions that led to INF uh, were, were quite unique. I um, mean, thinking about the, the personalities involved, Gorbachev and Reagan, their views on nuclear weapons, the geopolitical situation at the time, and that should cause us to be very cautious um, in using the INF uh, treaty, using the conditions that led to INF is some kind of replicable model uh, for today. Uh, so a, a few questions that I have um, relate to, first of all, INF um, and the imbalance. And, and I'm interested in your views on Reagan's, um, Reagan's perspective on the imbalance of the deal. Um, so we we know that Reagan wasn't always well attuned to the technical nuances of arms control, um, didn't necessarily always pay close attention to the technical nuances. And so I'm interested in your thoughts on if Reagan really saw INF in competitive terms, um, if he really wanted to lock in um, these key advantages, uh, or how much of that was just a byproduct of, of uh, interagency deliberations in the U.S. national security establishment. Um, that made its way into the final negotiating strategy. Um, the other question that I have is European views or related to European views on verification of INF. So we know that verification was a really controversial issue um, in the United States. It was a, a subject of visceral disagreement inside the US interagency, um, especially between State Department and DOD. So I'm, I'm interested to what degree was verification um, an issue for the Western Europeans and to what degree they actually had confidence in U.S. technical capabilities to monitor Soviet compliance uh, with INF. And um, also to, to what degree verification was a public issue um, in Western Europe. Um, also, in, in thinking about this, this idea of uh, threat perception and Oftentimes, the reality that the perception of the threat wasn't in line with technical realities. Um, to what degree was intelligence being shared among NATO members about the Soviet threat? And do we really have much indication from what you've seen of how much intelligence did or did not actually affect these deliberations that are going on? And did asymmetry and access to intelligence affect the conversation? The fact that the US and the UK, for example, had access to more exquisite forms of intelligence uh, than the West Germans and other members um, of NATO. Um, and finally, if, if there's time, I'd be interested in your comments on the, the delinkage of SDI and INF. So there's a lot of ideas um, that you know, historians have, have circulated on why Gorbachev did this. But I'm, I'm interested in your views on, on his motivation um, and the European views on linkage and ultimately delinkage between SDI and INF. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, excellent comments and some, some important questions. Uh, Susie, if you could take them on with an eye to the time, we have a number of people who'd like to ask questions. So if you could um, uh, be succinct in responding to Aaron's four questions. Yes, I will do my best. Um, these are all great questions. Thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate that. So with Reagan's views on uh, the advantages of INF, this is a sort of classic puzzle of studying Reagan. Uh, there is not a lot of evidence in Reagan's own hand often. So if you work at the Carter Library, Jimmy Carter's thoughts are everywhere. Carter scribbled on the margins, Carter left notes, to Zbig and told you what he thought. You can go a whole week in Simi Valley at the Reagan Library and never see Ronald Reagan's handwriting. 
Uh, so you often, what we know comes from what he put down in his diary uh, or what he told advisors and then where that was re reported, however faithfully is up to us as historians to weigh uh, in memoirs and oral history interviews. Um, the, the biggest indicator to me that Reagan did have at least some appreciation of how how clearly this uh, agreement was advantageous uh, to the United States in its position is that George Schultz in 1987 penned a series of memos that were very explicit about how getting an INF deal on these terms would be a huge uh, keystone in a broader strategy to uh, reduce tensions with the Soviet Union, but to do so in a way that was fundamentally favorable to U.S. interests. And I quote a few of those in the book, but the recent uh, Foreign Relations of the United States volume uh, that is the 86 to 89 volume has a number of these memos. And I think we can, based on how Schultz and Reagan operated, I think we can pretty safely assume that those many of those assessments from Schultz made their way into Reagan's thinking. Uh, they, they tended to be, as you know, in, in close um, cooperation with one another. The question of verification is a great one. And this is a place where I really look forward to seeing what is released uh, in, in the years to come archivally, because verification is very technical, and as you know, and so uh, many of the declassification specialists, not just in the United States, look at a bunch of really technical language and go, that seems scary, we shouldn't release that. That, that seems like maybe there's something there that we, we, should, we should protect. And so we don't have as much uh, information on the, the deliberations about verification uh, as as I, I suspect that there is is out there. Um, one of the interesting facets of the the whether it's a public issue is uh, actually in the optics that there is a, a sort of frustration almost about how all of these secret facilities that uh, police and army units and things had been deterring civilians from visiting or uh, or being able to, to go into, uh, that suddenly their gates were thrown open for Soviet uh, inspection uh, regime specialists to visit. And some people at the end of the Cold War sort of marveled at how, uh, how strange it was that they had been denied entry to a facility down the road from them. But here was a specialist from Moscow who was able to waltz right into this, this secret facility. Um, on the intelligence sharing, I, I, I think again, I, I suspect we are going to learn a lot more uh, in the years to come, but I, I think the dynamic that you point to of a fundamental asymmetry in the intelligence produces some other really fascinating knock-on dynamics in the alliance, where regularly I read assessments that uh, information, they knew the information sharing wasn't strong, uh, particularly in the non-Five Eyes uh, allies. So relations with the British were very strong. Relations with the Canadians sharing intelligence were quite strong, but say with the West Germans, not a Five Eyes member, so not nearly as strong. But then they would turn around and be frustrated that the West Germans didn't seem to understand the situation as Americans did, uh, even though they weren't privy to the same information. Uh, and that, so, and so often it would just be a, just trust us, we've seen the intelligence, uh, uh, which often produced some interesting decision-making uh, dynamics. And so I think in that respect, the asymmetry of intelligence did shape the nature of deliberations because there was often a, a dynamic of American officials saying, well, we just know better than you. You should just trust us. And unsurprisingly, with questions of nuclear weapons, many officials didn't like that response and said, well, can, you know, what can you share with us? Why should we why should we trust your view? Uh Maybe we see it differently, and, and that led to larger tensions about who speaks for the alliance and how alliance deliberation works. Uh, the, and then just very quickly on SDI and INF, you and I could talk about this a lot offline, but uh, I I think the the SDI piece of the puzzle I is is a really really fascinating one, and Gorbachev's decision to decouple that package. I really see as a result of a sense that time is running out. So a blend of economic factors, uh, the experience of Chernobyl and the accident there, uh, 
domestic turmoil, uh, the sort of ups and boom, ups and downs, boom bust of the Soviet economy in the 1980s. But the Gorbachev just feels that they need to try something different in order to remake the relationship. And that really is, I think, Gorbachev and and a few of his key advisors, uh, Yakovlev, Alexander Yakovlev, chief among them. Uh, but what's really interesting is this comes back to, to something you've both alluded to, right, about how the zero option was very popular in the early 1980s when it looked impossible. And then once the zero option looks possible, all of these Western Europeans turn around and say, wait, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to keep those missiles. Zero option is a, is a terrible one. And, and so Gorbachev's decision to depeg from SDI removes one of the only things that had been the backstop, right? Uh, Margaret Thatcher and, and many of her French counterparts at, right in the in the French Foreign Ministry and the British Foreign Ministry, lots of love for SDI because it stopped the zero option from happening. And so there's a famous right after Reagan and Gorbachev meet at Reykjavik and they have their sort of near package of abolishing nuclear weapons by the year 2000, this grandiose plan. Uh, and and there are all of these anonymous quotations in the newspaper. Thank God for SDI. Right. Those are from London. Uh, and so, so it's a huge blow uh, to to British and French policymakers when when the Soviets give up SDI and are willing to move ahead with INF as as its own deal. Um, thank you, um, Susie, for responding so succinctly. Let's go to a number of questions. We'll go first to um, Jeffrey Herf, who, of course, is the author by. War by Other Means, Soviet Power, West German Resistance, and the Battle of the Euro Missiles, a 1991 book about this very subject. Jeff, you're on. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you, Christian. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, and yes. Well, this is most interesting. Uh, and the hour is late. So very briefly, um, uh, I, am, I didn't hear what's new that was not in my war by other means or strobe talbot's uh deadly gambits or lawrence friedman's evolution of nuclear strategy uh and i'd like you to uh state more succinctly what is new in your book as a result what have we learned from your work in from in the archives that we didn't know in 1991 um and second your book is about the interaction of the Western governments, the anti-nuclear movements, the political parties in the West. In 2023, I'm concerned, and that, and I apply this to the comments of the two commentators as well, that I would hope that a younger generation of historians would address the question of strategic interaction between the Soviet Union and the West during the Cold War. And what it sounds like is a very internalist discussion of what was going on between the United States and Western Europe. But I don't think that's adequate. I think it has the result of diminishing reflection on the political purposes that the Soviet Union thought that it was accomplishing and was accomplishing. Uh, and I, I guess I'm one of those could, who could be uh, uh, convicted of, of offering uh, what you call the neat arc, but uh, the zero option and the deployments did turn out to be a smashing success. Excuse, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't use the word smashing. Uh, a, a great political success, uh, which is embarrassing uh, for the people who oppose them. And I, and I hear a little bit of that, both in your comments and in the commentators' comments. All right. Uh, so. Uh, Th th those are, you've done a lot of archival work. Tell us what's new and important as a result. Thank you, Jeff. Susie. Yeah, I don't, I, I think I am building on a bunch of great work and I don't genuinely believe uh, a lot in newness. I think that part of it is about uh, 
acknowledging great work that has already been done and being built on that. So, so that might just be my own personal view. But I think what I am bringing to the table that is fundamentally new is three things. I think one, I have a um, vastly expanded chronology of how we understand the Euro missiles that moves away from a specific focus on the apex of crisis uh, and to situate it in a broader understanding of how the Cold War worked as a system and then ultimately collapsed as a system. I think too, as uh, as Jordana probably highlighted better than I did, I think I make a case for changing our understanding of how NATO operated during the Cold War, uh, building in many respects on, on your own work to acknowledge the central centrality of, of West Germany uh, in a way that I would describe uh, that NATO is not really a U.S.-led institution, but rather a institution that was constantly being negotiated on a bond Washington axis. Yeah. And then the third thing that I, I think I do is actually about the packaging. I think I take uh, a lot of things that we knew, uh, but that were confined to different books, and I put them in one place that is accessible, adding new archival uh, texture and material and findings to tell a story that makes this very important episode accessible to a younger generation of people. And I see that as a as a critical contribution. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, David Kanan. Please unmute yourself. There we go. Can you hear me now, Christian? Yes, I can. Great. Um, I worked. I worked this issue intensely while while in the government between in the late seventies and the early in the early eighties. And um, Susie, your book sounds. It sounds like your book relates very much what I remember. It's very, congratulations on it. Um, and I very much agree with you that this was not a neat neat arc. Uh, there were there were many frustrations along the way, um, and it, uh, it it did not have to end the way that it did. So I, it sounds like you've really got this thing very, very well. Two small points. One on the SS twenty. Um, it, I agree with you. It's, we we really do need something out of the out of the, the Soviet and Warsaw Pact archives and to get a better idea of sort of the what's and the whys over there. It may be though that part of the of, of the story uh, is not just to do with the logic of the fit of these this weapon in the logic of arms control and, and nuclear relation nuclear security at the time, but also the fact that this was two thirds of the SS sixteen, the failed ICBM. There was a program they had that hadn't worked, but the first two stages did. Um, that very fact may have had something to do with the the, the policy of, 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 it, of its of its deployment. And also on the SS-20, it, it, it's also, I think, worth remembering that there was dispute within the U.S. government at the time, and, and this went into well into 1979, as to whether this thing was just and had just theater range, intermediate range, or was it an ICBM? There were those who in the government argued it was an ICBM. That discussion went on for a while and did affect some of the debates that went on over what, what to do about it. The second comment is, is, is on the, the disparity between the various European uh, reactions to all this and the American policy toward those reactions. After the failure of the ERW, the neutron bomb, and you're very right to connect this to what went on later, there was a deep concern that there not be another failure uh, after Schmidt made his speech. That speech got a lot of attention and not just publicly, it, it was taken very seriously by the administration at the time, and there was a real desire to respond to it. And that turned into what was eventually theater nuclear forces and became intermediate range nuclear forces. And there was a, a real desire to, as you said, accommodate uh, Schmidt and, and those who were concerned about this. And of course, that's one of the reasons why it was changed from TNF to INF. The Europeans didn't like being thought of as a mere theater. I would argue that that insecurity remains central to European security policy now as the Europeans try to figure their way in the, in the contemporary uh, in contemporary world. On the other hand, there was a public opposition. Really, you'd have, we, we, I'd like to bring a couple of other people in as I'm well. I'm very sorry. The public opposition went into, went, went into it, and, and that led to uh, real debates over uh, what to do about the, about the four countries and how to prevent them from turning it down in 80, uh, before 83. I'm sorry. I'll stop. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Susie, why don't we take this as a comment, which it was by and large, um, and uh, go to William Hill for the next question. William Hill, please unmute yourself. Still need to unmute yourself. Please do, we cannot hear you otherwise. <laughs> 
All right, since that's not working, let's go to Tom Schwartz. Tom Schwartz, you're next. Please unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me, Christian? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Susie, great book. I just want to ask a very specific question. To what extent did the failure of the Soviets to prevent uh, and block the missile deployment in 1983 play a crucial or an important role in Soviet uh, debates on the emergence of Gorbachev? Was it, in a sense, was it a significant factor in allowing Gorbachev's rise? Yeah, this is a great question uh, and an incredibly hard one to answer. And it's bound up in so much of the legacy of how the Euro missile story is remembered. I think uh, the I'm going to offer you a few vignettes that maybe hopefully add up to something like an answer. Uh, but it was a huge blow to Andropov, uh, who was the general secretary at the time, that they were not able to, to stop the missiles. There's this huge opportunity missed, causes a whole series of alliance management problems in the Warsaw Pact, uh, which was already struggling with many uh, alliance management problems by, by the early 1980s. And so it does deepen many of the, the structural problems already facing the Soviet Union in the early 1980s. I guess the other piece of the question, though, is about how much it paves the way for Gorbachev specifically and how much it paves the way for some type of change to regroup. And here I would point to the fact that the timing lines up uh, very, very neatly to look like uh, it is Gorbachev who agrees to come back to the negotiating table in the nuclear and space talks. But all of the diplomacy that brings the and, and wrangling that brings the Soviet Union back to Geneva to start negotiating again on INF and the rest of the omnibus package is done under Konstantin Chernyanko. And that's decided right before Chernyanko dies. Uh, probably one of the few things Chernyanko actually did uh, in his short-lived tenure. And so uh, Gorbachev inherits conditions where the decision to go back has already been made. And then I think Gorbachev, specifically the person and his life story, his political views, then really uh, shapes the narrative. But it's so striking in the Western assessments in 1985 or 1986, right after Gorbachev has come to power, just how uncertain they are about how new Gorbachev is. Right. Or whether the newness is just greater political efficiency and he is rerunning the old Soviet playbook of his predecessors. Thank you. Um, a question from Gail Maddox in the comments that I want to just probably close with. A questioner takes the talk to Asia briefly when there was a talk on iron on. Uh, of INF agreement focus on removing the missiles only from Europe to the Caucasus Mountains, thus leaving many Asians vulnerable. This resulted in a first time zero solution for the final INF agreement. Could you comment on the back and forth discussion leading to the agreement, obviously also with regard, you know, uh, with a view to the current uh, discussions um, uh, uh, related to Asia? Over to you, Susie. Yeah. So one of the most remarkable things about the way the relationship between the superpowers negotiations that lead up to the INF Treaty and the intra-alliance, intra-NATO deliberations is the question of Asia. Uh, the U.S. negotiating position uh, had placed global restrictions front and center, uh, and this was something that the Reagan administration prioritized quite heavily. Will Inboden writes about this quite well in his new book, The Peacemaker, uh, about Reagan's foreign policy but particularly with an eye to Japan, right? The, the prospect that if they signed an agreement in Europe uh, that would leave these missiles unrestricted in Asia, the Soviet Union might use it to, to target, uh, target the Japanese to create new trouble in uh, the American alliance system in Asia that was deemed uh, particularly problematic by the Reagan administration. And so the, the Reagan administration is, is vocal in that a global agreement is really a critical part of the package. But what is remarkable about that is the degree to which they are able to convince the Europeans that that is worth keeping, right? That, that even for those who would benefit uh, from a Europe-only agreement, there is just a remarkable amount of diplomatic effort on the, the part of the Reagan administration to keep uh, the various European allies on side 
over getting a, a global reduction. One of the great uh, sort of vignettes that is in Maynard Glitman's memoirs, uh, he'd been one of the negotiators on INF, was about a, a scouting trip that they did to potentially deploy um, missile INF missiles to Alaska uh, to prove that they too could deploy in Asia to try to convince the Soviets uh, to come to the table. So the, while the book is very much about Europe, the, the INF story has some fascinating Asian dimensions. And it really is a reminder that European security is not just in Europe and is, is a critical part of shaping the, the overall balance. Great. Thank you, Susie, for a really fascinating discussion. We clearly could have gone on. There were plenty more comments and questions in the Q&A. But uh, we like to call these sessions to a close uh, uh, after 90 minutes. So with thanks to you, uh, Susie, to Aaron, to Jordana, to Eric, of course. Um, what a great session. I learned a lot. Thank you for an enriching afternoon. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric for closing remarks. My thanks to everyone and to everyone in the audience. Apologies to those whose questions we couldn't get to. We invite you back next week to join the Washington History Seminar on Monday, February 6th for our session on Frank Castiglione's just published biography, Canon, A Life Between Worlds. Till then, take care. Good night. <laughs>